Now, I hear you want to learn a, a little about me. Well, I can't say much. It's not very easy to talk of myself. I would much rather tell you of your need for God's saving grace. But, if I mun, my name is Hugh Bourne, and I was born at Ford Hayes near Stoke on April the 3rd, 1772, to Joseph and Ellen. My father was a farm labourer and a drunkard. I'm told that I have a look of him, intemperate, but I thank God I do not possess his character. My saintly mother encouraged me to broaden my knowledge, to read and read and read, and it was by this reading that I understood my need for grace, for I had always felt the burden of sin, of wrongdoing, and felt the hot breath of old booty upon my collar. I began attending a Methodist chapel at Ridgeway with my mother, and it was at a love feast that I felt, head and heart, a Methodist, much to the disgust of my father, who despised the nonconformists. When I first felt called to preach, I could not look the listeners in the eye and covered my face for fear, but my confidence grew as God's purpose for me became clear. There was need for revival, see. We'd fallen, fallen so far from God's grace with those who'd worked so hard to feed and clothe and prosper this nation, being treated like salt, trampled underfoot, that change had to come. Like my father, many who laboured sought comfort in drink to the ruin of their bodies, minds and souls. I and others such as William Clowes, Daniel Shoebottom and James Crawford realised we had to take the message of God's grace to folk where they were, to the factories, to the mines, the kitchens, the fields, and it was in the fields we preached. Much to the vexation of the authorities and the Wesleyan Methodists, who feared mischief and mayhem as a result of our camp meetings, the first being held on the 31st of May 1807 at Malkop. So vexed they were that they removed my membership ticket for me and William Clowes. This administrative injustice, although hurtful, was not going to deter God's purpose. Indeed, it put grist to the wheel and spurred us on. I would not allow any distraction or frippery to come in the way of the saving of souls. I encouraged all who were called to preach, to preach. I understood that women had a particular gift, that they had a natural way to impart the love of God, both in the field, at the pulpit and around the kitchen table. The children were so full of questions delighted me. And I find that to preach to such as these was of particular import. In 1812, the movement I and William Clowes found ourselves leading settled on a name, the Primitive Methodists, called such to reflect the very beginnings of the church and that which John Wesley himself had implored Methodists to be, to share the good news, to take it to all the people, take it out. Take it out to the people. That was revival. And as our number increased, in the early days we were unadorned by both fashion and formality, preferring instead simple dress, no trousers in the pulpit, and lay preaching. Having been blessed by a mother who understood the importance of education, this was a subject for which I had an especial passion that the ordinary working man and woman had for so long be cowed by the lack of learning. I took it upon myself to remedy. So my brother James and I purchased a printing press and produced materials to aid reading and arithmetic and to promote broad interest in heaven and in the earth. The increase in worshipping souls to the movement necessitated coordination and organisation, which I was happy to oversee. Based on the Wesleyan model, we constructed a connection of circuits. Such was the reach of the burgeoning prims. And revival was not sufficient for this sceptred isle alone. And in time we called upon good folk to take the message of salvation to the North Americas. I myself, sailing across the Atlantic in my 70s, 
a crossing that parted my stomach from its breakfast as a daily ritual. A discomfort I was happy to endure for the Lord. Indeed, the greater discomfort was my feet. To save souls, I sacrificed my souls. From the miles and miles I trudged and the roads I tramped, my toes turned black and my ankles swelled. But I trudged on, fearing old booty would be nipping at my bleeding heels should I stop. In my 80th year, my affliction proved too great. And on the October the 11th, 1852, I was happily received by the Lord, being met in the first instance by old companions such as William Klaus, who had departed before me the year before, and my dear, dear mother. There it is, my story in a nutshell. There's much more to learn, for primitive Methodism did not die with me. It's at Anglesey Brook I rest. You can come and see.